Welcome to Best Sega Genesis Reviews by Classic Game Room, a collection of some of my favorite Sega Genesis reviews like Shinobi 3, Vector Man, Fatal Labyrinth, and more. The Sega Genesis is my all-time favorite video game console, 16 bits of blast processing, Truxton Musha, and Herzog's Wise. Why? Because it's incredible. Let's start this with my review of Shinobi 3, Return of the Ninja Master. Enjoy. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Come on, Shinobi. Do what ninjas do! Do the robot on the moving platform! There's few games that can top the revenge of Shinobi and... Shinobi can feel the beat! This may be one of them. Those are the hot... See, they look like hot dogs, don't they? Am I the only person in the world who thinks those look like hot dogs? Probably. I probably am kind of screwed up. Prepare to embark on one of the greatest video games of all time. Released in 1993, Shinobi 3 is a 16-bit masterpiece. Everything about this game is perfect. Everything. There's nothing not perfect in Shinobi 3. Nothing. Don't argue with me. Kick to the head. Kick to the head. Stupid bucket heads. Woo! We've got awesome music, sweet parallax, scrolling, and exploding ninjas, and that's just the first level. Woo! Yes! What treasure could be up here? Hot dogs, no! You keep your exploding hot dogs. This is easily one of the best Sega Genesis games. Woo! Oh, landed on his sword, don't do that. Don't land on his sword, Shinobi. Come on, we're gonna be like Michael Jackson off the wall! Woo! And maybe weird and misunderstood as well, who can say? Sega's Shinobi series has always been really good, but they just knocked the ball out of the park with this one. The action, the gameplay, the level design, the music, the enemies, everything about Shinobi 3 is at the top of its game. The game is very similar to The Revenge of Shinobi, but it came out three or four years later, and it looks like it. Also, the music, while equally good, is more crisp and clear than The Revenge of Shinobi. Every self-respecting game from back in the day had a waterfall. Shinobi 3 is no exception. Except for maybe Truxton, which was too badass for a waterfall. Woo! Flying ninjas! From Revenge of Shinobi! You've come back for me! I missed you too. Not much though, just a little bit. I mean, Shinobi must work out. He's got some crazy ass arm muscles. Like, I couldn't do this. At least not very well. I'm sure it would be entertaining to watch me fall to my death over and over. Oh, 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 oh! Exploding hot dogs. Oh, you missed me again! This guy is terrible at his job. If your job is to be an end boss, you should be doing better than this. Come on. Come on! Come- Oh! Oh! You, you, you're so predictable. Come on. Oh, you missed me again! And he exploded into flames. Shelby should have roasted marshmallows over his burning carcass. What? That's what I would do. This one plays a bit quicker than the Revenge of Shinobi, but the controls are very similar. One of my favorite features in Shinobi 3 is the background detail. They're, they're so cool. I love the 90s cyber techno pipes and caution stripes everywhere and blinking lights. 
The music captures the action and the atmosphere perfectly, and like Revenge of Shinobi, you have a limited number of shurikens, and that makes the game really tough. You can adjust the difficulty and number of shurikens before you begin. But no matter what level you're playing at, when you run out of shurikens, you're pretty much screwed. Shinobi may be a badass ninja, but he does rely heavily on his shurikens. There's a number of super tricky jumping sections in the game. You can jump once and jump twice at just the right moment. He'll do a spin in the air. That's something you'd better master early on or you won't get very far. And then he can also jump off the wall. As you'll see, you need to do that over and over and over again, frequently over things that will stab, impale, or electrocute you. Secret entry? Sounds like a dirty movie I saw on VHS once last week. Bring me ninjas to trample with my horse! Oh my god, this music's good. It really is good. The soundtrack is right up there with Musha and The Revenge of Shinobi. It's that good. This might be my favorite song in the game. This is a very good song. Woo! Treasure! Shinobi! Shinobi! Shinobi does what Shinobi does! Because that's what ninjas do. Suffer and die. I love the parallax scrolling. Extra shinobi. I'm riding a horse and killing things. This game just does not get any better. I mean, it does get better when he starts riding a jet ski killing things, but the point is there's not many, many games better than this. That sounds like a boss battle. Maybe a sub-boss battle. Prepare yourself for numerous boss battles with some serious movie inspiration once again. Do I want to kill things as a ninja or just rock out? Or do both. I shall do that. I'm not wasting a shuriken on you. Or you. I'm gonna kick you in the head numerous times until you explode. That's the second time I've said that today. Woo! -hoo! Yeah! Why can't I do that in real life? I wanna do the jump, kick, 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 followed by an explosion in real life. To just random people on the street. Like, hey! Woo! 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 It's a good thing they can't shoot off. Love these cyber whatever background. This is very cool. This game is pretty much beyond all quantifiable levels of cool. I mean, let's be honest. Is there any game cooler than Shinobi 3? Except Maybe Truxton, but even even in Truxton, you can't kick people on the head and make them explode. You have to shoot them with your rainbow circle shot, which is pretty cool. You shot me in the foot. I forget if this is the hot dogs. Is this hot dogs? Yep, hot dogs. Yeah, all right. Woo, go Shinobi. It's like Lady Gunface from Mushu. While not cheap, this game isn't terribly expensive for your Genesis or Mega Drive. You can also find Shinobi 3 in numerous Genesis collections on game systems like the PS2 and PlayStation 3. I suggest that you buy it or get kicked in the head by Shinobi. There's rivets over here for no particular reason. What's up, John McClane? Ha! You're not good at your job, and neither are you. However, Shinobi is very good at his job. You see, I know these guys are coming out from the pipes, so I just shoot them in the face with ninja stars. 
Oh, there's your 90s uh, caution paint there, letting you know that you're in the 90s. Yes! No! No, you killed Shinobi, you heartless, machine-gunning, nameless bad guy! I'm gonna use the ninja magic of whoop-ass. Oh, shit just got weird. Uh-oh, the weird stuff. I'm going backwards! Oh, no! I'm walking into machine gun fire. <laughs> machine gun fire doesn't bother Shinobi. I mean, it does a little bit. But not much. Yeah! This is such a good game. I don't know what I have to do with my fist now. I've run out of shurikens. Oh, and I missed the obvious shurikens right there. Oh! Now that was close. <laughs> it's like we're going through the Mountain Dew factory. What is that stuff? Um, I'm gonna go Mountain Dew. Prove me wrong. Prove that it is not Mountain Dew. You can't. You cannot prove that. Mountain Dew Swamp Creatures. Those things. This music is really smooth too. I like, I like this song a lot. Woo. I collect the shuriken, but avoid the pack of hot dogs that explodes. That's exactly what that looks like. I am going to make my way through the Mountain Dew processing plant where they keep all of the bodies that they use to make Mountain Dew, which by the way is green. What else was green? That's right, Soylent Green. What do you think Mountain Dew is? Oh, wrong. So I was admiring the background. It's not my fault. It's not my fault the game looks so good. I love the backgrounds, and I like this game so much that I used it as one of the example reviews in my book, How to Make a Video Game Review Show That Doesn't Suck. For starters, review Shinobi 3 over and over again, because you really can't go wrong. And then when you're done with this game, just go to Yara's Revenge or, or Musha. This part is tough, but Shinobi has the ninja skills to pay the ninja bills. I highly recommend Shinobi 3 for your Sega Genesis. Any game where you're attacked by brains and vats is, by definition, a good game. If brains and vats are doing the attacking, bodiless brains and like actually the brains sort of have little appendages can you make them out watch there so they got like little arms ah! actually i think those are legs oh hot dogs oh, oh. i have the power of ninjutsu of whatever that was actually i forget doesn't matter because it worked Round clear. Shinobi is a bad mother. Friendly neighborhood ninja. Ninjas riding jet skis. Win. It's not even a jet ski. It's like a powered surfboard, which I think is possibly even cooler. Woo! Oh. Get back here. Woo! Yeah! Mecha Godzilla! That's good. Because in the first game we fight regular Godzilla. Ah, oh, right in the foot! Curses! I was killed by Headless Mecha Godzilla. 
Again! Banished from Earth Plastic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Elemental Master, a game where you shoot laser beams out of your mullet. Yeah. Cut. Now it's time for me to put an end to your evil ways! No! I can't believe it. Long time no see, Layden. Stop playing Super Nintendo! What? Can you be Roki? Shut up! This music's awesome. Let's listen. This music is great! And so are the cutscenes here, this is really fun. Sadly, the rest of the game doesn't quite live up to this, but it's still interesting nonetheless. Let's take a look at Elemental Master, a vertical scrolling shooter on the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive from 1993. Where you play as this dude wearing a cape and what appears to be a mullet from the top down shooting lasers. Conceptually, it doesn't get much better, does it? You can shoot in front of you, you can shoot behind you, there's lava, and it's from Technosoft. And renovation. Technosoft in particular is known for making some of the very best games on the Sega Genesis, and you can hear a lot of those trademark Technosoft sound effects in here. If you've spent time playing Thunder Force and Herzog's Y, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Zwei? Because it likes you. Who are you? My name is Tinkerbell, but for copyright reasons, I've changed it to Nina. Why not? So the game starts off like Thunder Force 3. You can choose your path through the game. Which level do you want to start in first? I recommend Lava, which may not seem that easy when you start playing the game, but once you figure it out and memorize the level, it's no problem. And the Lava level gives you the best special weapon. Each time you complete a level, you get a new special weapon, but this is the only one you're ever going to need. So just start with Lava. A good life lesson for any situation. Each time you collect a special weapon after completing a level, you'll add it to your column on the right side of the screen there. If you hold down the fire button, you can charge it and unleash a power shot. And uh, that's the only reason you'll ever want to use any of the other special weapons, because they each have a different power shot. And those are handy for destroying end bosses. For the most part, the game's not that tough until you get to the last couple levels. The music's pretty good, and it's got that great Technosoft style from the early 90s, but it's nowhere near the quality of Thunder Force 4. However, any game where you destroy centaurs, alligators, crabs, and swamp people on screen at once with a lava spread shot is worth owning. got great music, over-the-top style, cool backgrounds, and swamp people. There's seven levels, the last three are tough, but not long. Still worth owning though because it's fun, even if it's short. And uh, yeah, yeah, I walked right into that one. That's what she said. So I have two people to thank for sending this to the show. Joseph from Oak Forest, Illinois. Thank you, Joseph. And Ahmed from Springfield Gardens, New York. Thanks to both you guys for sending Elemental Master. Master the elements and the power of your hair to defeat swamp people and centaurs. See, you, you can't go wrong with that. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Super Thunder Blade on the Sega Genesis, and I'll be playing this with the Allen 9000 Modified 
Sega Genesis 6 button arcade stick. Which is hard to miss. Also, it has a boat horn. Super Thunder Blade from 1989, one of the early Genesis releases. I remember this game when it was new. Loved it and revisiting it many years later, it's still fun and extremely challenging. It's one of the Sega flying in circle flight games like Afterburner or Space Harrier Galaxy Quest 2. Wait, no, I'm sorry, I'm still hoping for a Galaxy Quest 2. Galaxy Force 2. Someone needs to get on a Galaxy Quest 2. We need that right now. Super Thunder Blade has a lot in common with a couple other Sega arcade games, most notably Afterburner and Galaxy Force 2 and Space Harrier. So you move in pretty much the same way each time. You just go in circles so that nothing hits you. And what Super Thunder Blade does is it mixes up the gameplay and the levels so that while you continue just flying in circles, you have to avoid different things, like pillars, trees, caves, or whatever. But if you stop flying in circles, you die. So that's rule number one when playing this game or Afterburner, Galaxy Force 2, Space Harrier. Never stop flying in circles. Just look at what I'm doing. Going down and left, up and right. That's no exaggeration, that is exactly what you do in this game. You just fly in circles and avoid things, which gets far more challenging, especially level 2, which I find particularly difficult. In between levels, there's this pseudo top-down vertical scrolling shooter segment, except unlike most of these games, and unlike the first Thunder Blade, you can't fly around the screen, so you just keep going left and right. You just sweep the enemies left and right and try not to fly into their fire. In addition to machine gunning enemies and shooting missiles at them, your helicopter also comes equipped with a brake. Now, unlike most games where I say that braking is for cowards, in Super Thunder Blade, you need your brake to survive. It is not cowardly to use your brake in Super Thunder Blade. Otherwise, you will crash right into things. Notice that inside the cave, I'm still flying in circles, but I'm slowing down as to not crash into the pillars. A technique that you'll use in all the levels in this game where there's stuff in your way. Flying in circles, just flying in circles. I will let the homing missiles do what homing missiles do. Home on things and destroy them. When this game was new, it was visually spectacular. I remember my friend had this and it was just amazing. There you go. But playing it again after all these years, I actually think the first Thunder Blade is a more innovative game. Yay, some bonus points! Alright, the top-down sections in Super Thunder Blade are the low point of the game, for sure. They break up the flying segments, but they really don't add all that much once you figure out the pattern. Here's level 3, which has a great looking sunset in the background, and you're fighting helicopters and boats. It's a cool game! But of the group that I mentioned, Afterburner, Space, Harrier, Galaxy Force 2, and Super Thunder Blade, this is probably the weakest of the bunch. And that's not to say it's bad. Oh no! I crashed into a building! I was distracted by the glittery power of the Allen 9000. It, it's just not quite as good as those other ones, and it's hard to put a finger on why. Maybe because it's a helicopter and that finger would get chopped right off. Ooh, it's a giant flying space aircraft carrier thing, of course. We'll blow this up for fun and move on to the next level, which is quite challenging. It's a cave level. Alright, this one's tough. You have to continue crashing into things.
I like this game, but I don't love it as much as Afterburner. However, if you like those other games I've mentioned, and you have a Sega Genesis, which of course you should, Super Thunder Blade is dirt cheap. It's an early release, there's a lot of these out there. This one won't cost you more than just a couple bucks. That's right, I'm confusing all of you by flying in circles. If you ever double back in this game, like change directions, mid-circle, you're dead. Instantly. Don't ever do that. I tried doing that earlier and it, it was bad. There's a few difficulty settings you can change your player stock. It's a tough game that packs that good late 80s, early 90s Sega Genesis or Mega Drive style. What I like most about it is that it reminds me of those days that my friend and I would spend playing Super Thunder Blade back in the day. It's got such a wonderful Sega style. I love the robot end boss here. You cannot defeat my circle motion fly- oh. They figured me out that time. If you like any of those other games I mentioned, add this one to your collection at once. It's Super Thunder Blade. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where it's time to break out that Tower of Power. It's Battle Toads for the Sega Genesis being played with the assistance of the Game Genie. Because who doesn't love more lives? Come on, more toads, more better. Widely regarded as one of the most difficult video games ever created, Battletoads is the definition of NES hard. Originally released in 1991 for the NES, this is the Sega Genesis version, and while Battletoads is from developer Rare, I have a sneaking suspicion it was actually funded by Galoob and Codemasters to sell Game Genies. That's my conspiracy theory anyway, I think I can get to the snake level without one. If I can pick up enough extra lives from bouncing birds against the wall in the tunnel level. At least Battletoads makes it somewhat easy to get extra lives, because you'll really need them. Battletoads is pretty intense, and this is supposedly an easier version of the game than the NES one. So obviously I don't stand a chance on the Nintendo, but I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed the game on the Sega Genesis, despite its insane difficulty and the fact that I actually suck at playing video games. It's a great game. Before the years of making games long for the sake of just being long and then adding DLC to make them even longer, they just made games really difficult. And Battletoads is very difficult, but it's also a fairly substantial game, filled with a wide variety of level types, brilliant colors, and challenges that, given some time, you will eventually overcome once you memorize them, assuming you have halfway decent reflexes. And a Game Genie helps. It's like this epic mashup of side-scrolling beat-em-up, side-scrolling platformer, and racing game. So at least I'm good at one out of the three, right? It's, it's still not enough. Battletoads requires repeat gameplay and memorization. This game was meant to keep you hooked for months. And it'll still do that because of its creative level design and amazing music. This was released as part of the Rare Replay for Xbox One. You can also get Battletoads games for the Game Gear and the Game Boy. Surfing frogs? What do they think of next? How about giant death snakes? W what's the purpose behind these things? Why fill a pit with robot death snakes when the hover scooters should do the job? I really like the music in Battletoads. I was actually inspired to play this game after Derek Langley sent the Battletoads soundtrack on vinyl. Which is incredible, by the way. The Genesis version sounds good, but the vinyl has even more dynamic range. 
Sounds great. Complete review of this thing coming soon, except now it'll just bring back nightmares of me dying over and 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 over again. Now, if you compare this to the NES version, the Genesis or Mega Drive version of Battletoads is more colorful and vibrant for sure. There's greater detail and I think the music sounds better. I think the additional blast processing just makes this version of the game play better, even though the NES one is still very good. I'll review that separately. Fancy your chances? You know, she's got great cleavage, but a weird ass smile. Ah, she's terrifying. No wonder the Battletoads are trying to destroy her. Everyone's favorite knockoff Ninja Turtles. I think they even had their own TV show back in the day. There's a couple different Battletoads games. Personally, I like the Battletoads and Double Dragon one a lot. Reviewed that a year or two ago. That was a lot of fun. The arcade machine is also really good. This is a great game if you're looking for a challenging game that's well made, which will put you in your place. This will take some time to defeat, even with the Game Genie. It's tough. And I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you going all the way to Mark from Rangeville, Australia. Thank you, Mark. Battle Toads is a game that everyone watching this show should play because it will put all other games in perspective. Everything else is easy compared to Battle Toads. You can play two player, but that gameplay dies fast during the racing sequences because somebody dies and then you have to restart the level. Fun game, it lives up to its reputation. Battle Toads, thanks again, Mark. I love the soundtrack, so thanks to Derek for that. And I'll see you in the review of Battle Toads for the NES soon. I'm a glutton for punishment. Also, that smile has to be stopped. There's something wrong with it. This may be the only game on Sega Genesis where I can say that my favorite part of the game is watching the characters beat the crap out of the Sega logo at the beginning. It's Eternal Champions, a 2D fighting game released in 1993 from Sega that, not surprisingly, feels a lot like Street Fighter 2 meets Mortal Kombat. the two hot games from the early 90s. I've talked about this before, but I remember vividly seeing lines wrapped around the Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat machines. Fortunately, there was no line wrapped around Pit Fighter, so I played that a lot. Anyway, Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat sold like hotcakes on the Sega Genesis. But neither of those games were owned by Sega. I guess they wanted a piece of the action and created this. Skipping the arcades altogether and just going to the Sega Genesis. And later the Sega CD. You choose one of the greatest fighters in history who died too soon. Summoned to fight in the Eternal Champion Contest or whatever. If you don't know all of your moves backwards and forwards, this game is insanely difficult. There's a couple different modes of gameplay, including some training modes, practice, and the Eternal Champions Contest. And you're gonna have to work your way up to that. Start by beating the crap out of a floaty silver ball. And then move on to the practice mode where you can adjust the difficulty. Of course, Eternal Champions also comes with an awesome local on the couch two-player mode. Personally, I find Eternal Champions to be more playable than Mortal Kombat. Not as playable as Street Fighter 2, but still oozing with that awesome early 90s style. Like, Sega had to do something to make the game stand out and look different. And I think they succeeded. 
kind of gotta give them credit for the soundtrack. Some of the music is interesting, and it feels like they put a lot of work into it, but it's not the best on the Genesis. This is one of the games that gives you an option to play with the three button controller or the six button Sega Genesis gamepad or arcade stick. In fact, you may want to go with an arcade stick because many of the moves require you to push numerous buttons all at once that are hard to get at with the gamepad. You can only get so far in Eternal Champions with punching and kicking and blocking. You've got to know your special moves and each character has a lot of them. And it's important to note you still can't rely on them because eventually you'll run out of power and you won't be able to use your special moves until your little meter on the top left fills up again. Technically, Eternal Champions is a pretty solid release on the Sega Genesis, but I think it's a you're gonna like it or you're not gonna like it kind of game. If you're into memorizing some tricky special moves and keeping an eye on your power bar and using them at just the right time to win a match, then I think you'll love Eternal Champions. If you want to just jump around the screen, punch and kick and flail about, which is how I play fighting games, then it's probably not exactly for you, but it does have a super cool look and feel and style all its own. And I spent some time here recording the fatalities for all of you to enjoy, or overkills, as they're known in Eternal Champions. Just like in Mortal Kombat, you can finish off your opponents in a spectacular, gory style if you can figure out how. It's pretty tricky, you have to be the character whose stage you're on and then throw your opponent from a specific spot on screen. It burns! It's one of the better Sega Genesis fighting games, but not quite as good as Cosmic Carnage on the 32X, but that has the added horsepower of the 32X add-on, of course. And hey, how about a Sega 32X sized shout out and thank you to Dennis from Lakeland, Florida for sending Eternal Champions to the show. Thank you, Dennis. Here we have Cyborg Bandana wearing Jean-Claude Van Damme versus Future Space Wesley Snipes. And his name is Rax. I guess Arby's was taken. And hey, you know what Street Fighter 2 doesn't have? A caveman! Yeah, let's add one of those. And a 1930s detective and Psylocke, but we won't call her Psylocke. Eternal Champions is pretty cheap and easy to find these days for your Sega Genesis or Mega Drive. If you like fighting games and think it looks cool, pick up a copy, give it a play. The Sega CD version is called Eternal Champions Challenge from the Dark Side, which gives you more characters and backgrounds. I've got a copy of that, and it's definitely better than this one. But the Genesis version is cheaper, and invite some friends over, have a good time playing Eternal Champions. Remember, you are the Eternal Champions! Vanished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room. Prepare to have your mind exploded because I've got 32 times the blast processing coming your way in Shadow Squadron. Listen carefully, everyone, because this is the sound of blast processing. This is the sound of victory on the Sega 32X. It's Shadow Squadron from 1995. Woo! A game that could have been Sega's answer to Nintendo's Star Fox if only it had some more talking animals. 
But nope, what it lacks in talking animals, it more than makes up for with Blast Processing. Also, it's a super cool game. Shadow Squadron, it just sounds cool, and the logo looks cool. The game is cool. Annoyingly though, the gameplay is stuck in the neutral zone of only average, though. The neutral zone. You know what that means. I'm waiting for you to answer that one, actually. I don't know. What does that mean? Does that mean you can buy Romulan Ale tax-free? There's like a duty-free shop floating in the middle of the neutral zone. <laughs> Deep Space 7. This game kind of reminds me of Star Trek in a way. I think it's probably the ship designs. Shadow Squadron has a great look and feel and plays surprisingly well. You can really feel the power of the 32X with this one. It's, it's a smooth game and pretty complex for a mid-90s home game system flight sim. But Shadow Squadron is definitely missing something. It's hard to put a finger on it, but this one feels somewhat incomplete. Shadow Squadron is pretty straightforward. You choose one of two spaceships and basically fly through six missions, tearing apart the enemy fleet. The problem is, as you'll quickly learn while playing this game, the first ship, the Feather One, is pretty much useless. That's what I'm using here. It feels faster, more nimble, it has laser machine guns, homing missiles, and a shield. None of which really do you any good in Shadow Squadron. The Feather 2 is a better choice because it's far more powerful. The difference is that it doesn't regenerate its shields or its energy bar after each mission. Also, and this is probably the more important reason, the Feather 2 can shoot down the enemy shots coming at you. Which means that you can actually survive the last couple levels of Shadow Squadron. It's easy to play through this game with continues, but getting through it on one credit is a challenge. I love the added touch of the ships being moved into position before they launch. The Feather 1 comes from within the uh, whatever it is, and the Feather 2 sort of slides out from the side. Hey, the Feather 2 also has really cool looking torpedoes, but you'll never want to use them because they deplete your energy bar, which you can never regenerate. It's like a few things are missing from this game. Yet, even with its shortcomings, Shadow Squadron is one of the must-own Sega 32X titles. And I know there's not that many of them. You've got Cosmic Carnage, Calibri... ...and definitely Shadow Squadron, if for no other reason than the music is really good. But I'm most impressed with how well this plays. It's way above average for a mid-90s home game console flight game. Or at least it did until some good PC games started hitting the 3DO and PlayStation, but it's kind of in a different league. This game's pretty impressive for what it is, but odds are it won't hold your attention for that long. Once you figure out how to attack each of the space battleships, you'll tear them to pieces without breaking a sweat. Just be careful not to run into anything. And make sure to turn up the volume because the music's really good. In most respects, I think that Shadow Squadron is very impressive. There's a lot of talent behind this game, but I have a theory that they pulled the plug, probably because of poor 32X sales, before it was finished. It's like a few obvious things that would make this game better just aren't there. For example, the enemy fighters should be more of a threat. They're just a nuisance as it is. And you should be able to regenerate your shield somehow. Unless you're playing the last mission or playing with continues, because then who cares, but... You know, maybe the best reason to pick up Shadow Squadron is that it vindicates the Sega 32X. This, more than any other game that I can think of, shows that the 32X add-on for your Sega Genesis was capable of more. It even has an object viewer, which is pretty cool, so that you can admire all of this spaceship and battleship 
designs including the Death Hugger. What a great name. Shadow Squadron, if you're collecting for the 32X, it's a must own. If you're not collecting for the 32X, well, you're missing the Cosmic Carnage Party, so I don't know what you're waiting for. Get on that, and then make sure to pick up Shadow Squadron. Behold the mighty tower of power, the Sega 32X, sitting on top of my Sega Genesis. And I love the Shadow Squadron cartridge artwork. It looks really great. Nice use of color. I mean, you really can't go wrong with explosions. The 32X logo, Sega, and a cool title like Shadow Squadron. I don't have the box for this game, but I've seen it online. It also looks really good, so... Highly recommended. I picked this one up years ago for just a couple bucks. It's not all that expensive. Took me a while to play it, but glad that I did. Shadow Squadron. Give it some time. Definitely practice uh, with both spaceships to figure out which you like best. But I think you'll choose the Feather 2 because the Feather 1 is pretty much useless. Especially when you can't shoot down those enemy projectiles because you'll spend most of your time in the game fighting those battleships. And uh, remember for that giant one in Mission 5, you have to fly into the front of it and shoot the red thing on the inside. It took me a while to figure that out, but Shadow Squadron's not bad. Pretty cool game, and it's a shame the 32X wasn't around all that much longer. Maybe they would have uh, either finished this one or at least given us a sequel with some improvements. So, Shadow Squadron. Highly recommended. Rock. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, broadcasting to you from in front of Outdoor Simulation Wall 9000, simulating an arctic environment for the review of Vector Man on Sega Genesis, not the GameCom. Boo! Vector Man from 1995 on the Sega Genesis. You know, there's a lot of games that I play where I have to ask myself, why isn't this a household name? Why didn't Vector Man really catch on? Why aren't we up to Vector Man 12 by now? With Vector Man Kart Racing and Vector Man Tactics. Vector Man First Person Shooter. Vector Man the Movie, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme versus Street Fighter. Also starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Doctor Vector Man, and of course, Vector Man on the Vectrex. Versus Godzilla. Because those who have experienced Vector Man love it. It's a great game. Sadly, a casualty of its release date. Vector Man is a great game and shows what the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive was capable of in 1995. Incredible visuals, rich detailed backgrounds, great music and most importantly, solid gameplay. Vector Man is an extremely well-made platformer. But 1995 was at the tail end of the Sega Genesis lifespan, and tastes were beginning to change. People were starting to get into 3D games like Doom and GoldenEye 007. In 1995 and 96, people were moving on to the Sony PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and N64. After one sequel, unless you're a Sega Genesis fanboy, Vector Man has pretty much faded away into obscurity. But we should never forget the majesty of Vector Man, because this is a truly remarkable game. And it's a shame that he was never really supported and allowed to flourish like Rayman. But let's look at Vector Man. What makes this game so damn good? Well, for starters, 
The visuals and the music are great. It's a pretty traditional platformer for the most part. You run around, you jump, you shoot enemies, and collect some power-ups, which make Vector Man alter his form a bit. He can turn into bombs and, like, cars and stuff that open up new parts of the levels, and the levels are big. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog big. There's lots of room to explore, and upgrades laying everywhere. Health upgrades, shotgun power-ups, machine gun power-ups. At the end of most of the levels, Vector Man battles an end boss, and he's scored for all of the stuff that he collects and TV sets that he destroys. Ironic, considering that Vector Man was played on TV. If the game has a weak point, it's these top-down levels that feel out of place and don't really play like Vector Man. The side-scrolling parts are fluid and play really well, and there's very little slowdown considering how much stuff is going on on-screen at once. There's a lot of good lighting effects in Vector Man as well, considering this is a 2D game. The backgrounds are always extremely interesting, good use of colors. And while Vector Man the character is likable, he's not terribly well drawn out. Maybe that would have come with more sequels. Like, what's his personality? He's kind of a cool dude, but aside from saving the Earth, what's Vector Man's real motivation? I like this level a lot. Love the music, which sounds great in stereo. These days, Vector Man can be found pretty much anywhere. It's on the Virtual Console, as well as in numerous Sega Genesis collections like Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection. I think Vector Man is due to make a return. I have two people to thank for sending this Sega Genesis game cartridge to the show. Here's a big classic game room shout out and thank you to Henry from Columbia, Maryland as well as Mohammed from Qatar. Viva le Vector Man! May he return on the Vectrex. Or at least the Sega 32X. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room. What happens when you combine the power of the compact disc with the Konami Justifier? You get this game, it's Lethal Enforcers, on Sega CD. It sounds a lot better in the game. Lethal Enforcers is a 1992 arcade light gun game from Konami, capably handled here on the Sega CD attachment for the Sega Genesis. What you do is simple, you grip the justifier like a tool of destruction, bringing down justice. One shot at a time while avoiding innocence and scoring points. Make crime pay the ultimate price. Death by blinking and scoring you points. Lethal Enforcers is a lot of fun if you enjoy arcade light gun games and the music is outstanding. This is where the Sega CD really shines. Early 90s video game music on compact disc. It really sounds good too. Obviously, the game is harder the further back you stand from the TV, and you'll need a CRT television to play this one. The old school light gun games do not work on modern LCD, flat screens, plasma screens, or projection screens. Discrimination! 
This one's tougher than you might expect, though, because you have to play a great game to move on to the next stage. And by a great game, I mean not shooting the good people. And by good people, I mean cops, civilians, senior citizens, and cowards ducking and running for cover. If you accidentally shoot any of them, you don't move on to the next round. And that's tough, because it's so tempting. Help me! Could you be more specific? How would you like me to help you? As you play through the game, keep an eye out for weapon upgrades. The shotgun in particular is excellent. Sega CD performance is very good. As you can see, this has one or two player gameplay. So if you have two justifiers and a friend, that's some buddy cop action waiting to be had. These are always fun two player games. Lethal Enforcers is best enjoyed as a social game like most light gun games from this era. It's the same game over and over again. The enemies always appear at the same time at the same location. So memorization as well as aim is the key to getting ahead. And they're just fun to play with a friend, laughing and yelling at the screen. This is a great home console version of the arcade machine. Whoops, I shot the guy sleeping on the bench. What were you doing sleeping on the bench in the middle of a gunfight? Well, all bets are off now. I'm shooting everything that moves because there's no way I'm moving on to the next level anyway. I should be rewarded. Out of the goodness of my heart, I let that one lady run by and then shot the other person who was guilty of VHS piracy. Innocent? I think not. You can't have one of these games without a subway scene. Now's the time for the classic game room. Shout out and thank you to Billy from Boston, from North Reading, Massachusetts. That guy was talking on his cell phone in the quiet section, by the way. So innocent? No. No, why am I being penalized? I'm doing those other passengers a favor. Yelling help me and screaming is also in violation of the quiet part of the train. So thanks to Billy for sending this, bringing it to my attention so I could show the hypocrisy of lethal enforcers. Is anybody really innocent? I mean, come on. I'm enforcing business class. Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Jungle Strike, the sequel to Desert Strike, and this game is kind of banged up but still plays because the Sega Genesis keeps on Truxton. Yes, if the game has a kick-ass helicopter, it's off to a good start. Welcome to the review of Jungle Strike, which was released in 1993 on the Sega Genesis. This is the second game in the Strike series. The first one being the Amazing Desert Strike, which came out a year earlier. And wowed those of us playing Sega Genesis back in the day. These were ambitious games at the time. I like how her mouth moves, but not the rest of her face. It's great. The Strike games helped to usher the video game industry into the era of 3D open world games. Just a few years earlier, this would have looked a lot like Choplifter. And what's amazing is that it runs smoothly. Also, I have to compliment this guy on kicking his clean white sneakers up on the table. That's a real display of attitude right there. That's like saying, hey, I know what my targets are. I'm just choosing to ignore them and I'll blow up this station wagon instead. 
You really couldn't do stuff like this in video games back in 1993. Jungle Strike was ahead of its time. And it was a lot of fun, but I must have been way better at video games back when I was 17 because I remember cruising right through this, but now it's, it's really tough. You've really got to memorize every level, and thankfully there's a password save and continue system to keep you going. Jungle Strike is no joke. If you play this game without just lifting all the codes from the internet, it puts up a massive challenge. It's also a lot of fun. But it certainly seems unfair at times. The enemies will just take you out from off screen. Jungle Strike is laid out pretty well. There's nine missions total, each with numerous objectives. Hitting start on your Genesis controller will pull up the map and objective screen, which is really helpful. That'll also show you where to pick up some fuel and ammo. That's right, not only can you explode and die, but you can crash and burn, which also results in death. Thankfully, you have some extra lives, and yes, there are codes on the internet to give you even more. Because trust me, the more lives, the merrier. Jungle Strike isn't going to take it easy on you. Therefore, you shouldn't take it easy on them. You can machine gun enemies, launch missiles. You can even use harsh language. It works great. I came up with this neat little trick to blow up some of the harder enemies like tanks where you fly in towards them using harsh language all the way. Machine gunning and launching missiles then back away before they hit you and then fly back in and do it again. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you just explode in a ball of fire but it's all fun because you're playing games on the Genesis and what's not to love about that? There's some nice built-in stress relief in Jungle Strike, though. After getting your ass kicked enough times, sometimes you just need to blow up something that's not gonna shoot back. I'm sure those were covered by insurance. Don't worry about it. Jungle Strike's really tricky. Like Desert Strike, you, you need to memorize the level beforehand in order to know what you're attacking because by the time you figure it out if they don't destroy you first you'll run out of fuel anyway now one of the best features in this game is of course multiple vehicles there's the supersonic hovercraft i'm just assuming it's supersonic like why would you build a hovercraft that isn't and of course the f-117 stealth fighter just hanging out in the middle of the jungle that flies around in circles and runs into things it's super fun Sorry about your ancient rock structure, my bad. I'm used to flying a helicopter, not a jet. And I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you to send to my man Mohammed from Qatar for sending this to the show a while ago. It's taken me a long time to play it. I like the Strike series of games. There's a whole bunch of them. Desert Strike, Jungle Strike, Nuclear Strike, Soviet Strike, and uh, Surgical Strike. Which isn't really part of the series, but it's a fun game anyway. Jungle Strike. Waka 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 waka! Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Pac Mania on the Sega Genesis. According to the box, it's more fun than ever. Pac Man in 3D. Is it better than the original 2D Pac Man? Let's find out. He can jump. Pac Man can feel pain. 
from Tengen. Look at the menus. It's like they spent five minutes on that. It's Pac-Mania for the Sega Genesis, which was originally released to the arcades by Namco in 1987. This is a 1991 Genesis release that looks pretty good, but I still have bad memories of Pac-Mania from, from the arcade, from the pseudo-arcade, like a movie theater. Arcade. When I was a teenager, there's a there was a movie theater nearby that had Pac-Mania, and I never really liked it. I always found that it was too slow, and just not quite as cool as Pac-Man or Ms. Pac-Man. But playing it this many years later, I actually I kind of enjoy it. It's not my favorite Pac-Man, but I like that there's a lot of inspiration from Super Pac-Man, and they took a lot of stuff from this game and actually incorporated it into later Pac-Man games. I like that Pac-Man can jump. Of course this brings up the question, could Pac-Man jump all along? Did he choose not to jump in the original Pac-Man game? Because it really changes things. When you're not cornered by ghosts, it affects how you play Pac-Man. Now eventually the ghosts begin to jump as well, also there's more of them, and you can't see the entire board, so ghosts can sneak up on you when you least expect it, although you should always expect ghosts. You can jump over at least two of them at once. Annoyingly, you don't get points for jumping over them, though. I think that'd be actually pretty fun. In addition to jumping, the biggest difference between this game and original Pac-Man or Super Pac-Man or even Ms. Pac-Man is the viewpoint, which, as you can see, is, is more of a 3D-ish Pac-Man. One of many attempts from Namco back in the day to modernize the Pac-Man games. These days, I think we love Pac-Man because it's retro cool and it's just classic Pac-Man. I mean, I just love old school 2D Pac-Man. But in the late 80s, early 90s, that wasn't good enough for the arcades. People needed like 3D-ish everything. I'm surprised they didn't make a Pac-Man fighting game. Well, I guess maybe they did. Pac-Man's in Smash Brothers, right? So uh, he was destined for a fighting game anyway. He just didn't know it yet. Pac-Mania is somewhere in between Super Pac-Man and Pac-Man Championship Edition. They borrow things, this game borrows things from Super Pac-Man, like coffee and the speed-up pill. And the jumping and some of the other stuff ends up in the later Pac-Man games. It's fun, and it's a decent Sega Genesis release, but not great. I mean, the game can only be as good as the original game to begin with. Visually, I think it looks pretty nice on the Genesis. It certainly looks like Pac-Mania, but this is a textbook example of Sega Genesis music done wrong. It's awful. <laughs> But I also don't really remember what the original game sounded like either, so... Music doesn't add much to Pac-Man, unless it's the original Pac-Man music, which I'm quite fond of. What you really want to listen to while playing Pac-Man is the sound of the arcades. Like, you want Dig Dug and Duran Duran in the background. While this isn't the liveliest, most exciting Pac-Man game, it is tough. It's challenging, very challenging after the first couple rounds. It has that perfect arcade Pac-Man risk versus reward style. Do you go for all the ghosts or play it safe and just collect the dots and aim for the fruit and the special, the uh, special items? You gotta be careful jumping though. These ghosts are uh, sometimes... They're sneaky, these these ghosts, the undead. You gotta watch out for them. And a big thank you to my friend Mark from East Meadow, New York, once again for sending this to the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for sending the Pac-Mania. If you love Pac-Man and you love Genesis, maybe give it a try. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Fatal Labyrinth on the Sega Genesis. A dungeon crawling RPG adventure style game where you enter a labyrinth prepared to die. Screw that thing. 
Now I'm hungry. Warrior needs food badly. <laughs> Look, mutton! Do you dare enter the Fatal Labyrinth? From 1991 for your Sega Genesis, a dungeon crawling RPG style game where you grind your way to the top of a tower. The villagers and the old guy at the entrance warn you repeatedly not to enter the Fatal Labyrinth. It is called a Fatal Labyrinth. That That is not a very welcoming name for this thing. But you enter it anyway. This it's a fun game if you're into these grinding dungeon crawlers. It's got the old school Sega Genesis style. It's an easy game to dive into and fun if you like grinding. If you're not so into grinding, you're not going to enjoy it. But this is one of these good late night games. Just, just fight monsters, level up, collect weapons. It's actually pretty tricky. I found this one to be quite challenging because you've got to know how to use your magic canes and your magic scrolls and your magic potions to defeat the Fatal Labyrinth. The music does get old after a while. They should re-release this game on Sega CD with, th with some more music and just call it Die Dungeon. I would play Die Dungeon. Who's up for a fun afternoon of Die Dungeon? This guy. He's very stylish. Mutton! Mmm. Delicious. Thankfully that was a healing potion. There we go. I'm not going to touch the robot yet. Not until I uh, level up a couple times here. Red potion, leather armor, leather shield, all that stuff is crap. What is this thing, a shark? <laughs> I have destroyed the floor shark. I love this game now. Any game with floor sharks is a good game. I call them the eggplant snails. Because when you enter the room and they're facing you, they look like eggplants. Am I the only person that thinks this? Probably. Hit them! <laughs> How hard is it to kill an eggplant snail? Can't I just step on the floor sharks? Green ring, what's that do? What do these do? What's the green ring do? Bad things, apparently. Right. Sometimes you need to use your scrolls to figure out what they are. Like, I don't know what the yellow one does. The monsters are confused. Well, so am I. Join the club. Get me out of this cursed labyrinth! It is fatal! A brown potion? What is that, like A1 steak sauce? I kind of like the simplicity of just running into enemies to fight them. Buttons just overcomplicate things. Just, just run into the enemy. Die! Did he steal my pants? You better not have. They're very important to me. Oh, you... No, I don't feel like dancing! You monsters need to buy me a drink before I do that. Woo! My, all right, now I've leveled up, finally. That's good. I am now a battle man. Battle man, got it? It's kind of like Battle Cat, except human. The drunk crystals are the worst! Is it wrong that whenever I think of anything having to do with He-Man at all? You already know where I'm going with this. I, I just, you, you can just finish my sentence. She was. Especially in her short skirt and her boots. Stop filling me with groove. I need to find some new armor. Each time you play Fatal Labyrinth, it's a different game. But the ending is always the same. It's called Fatal Labyrinth. Like, what do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to die. Eventually. Potion. Red potion. Yeah. 
Chop his freaking foot off! Imposter egg robot! You're no elemental gimmick gear! If you understood that, then you need to get out more. I read on the internet that there's a cheat where if you equip both short bows, your armor maxes out. Let's find out. Let's see. Uh, we go to bow. Use short bow. Use short bow. You equip short bow. That's what I do. Equip short bow. No, that does not seem to make a difference. Never mind. Discard. Just how about we? Never mind. Go do away with it. Equip battle axe. The battle axe is a good choice, except apparently um, the accuracy is very low. So if you could just imagine some drunken, incoherent idiot swinging an axe around, it's probably a pretty good image of uh, my guy in this game. After uh, after all, he is hitting the magic meat as fast as possible. Can you blame him? Stupid ninja. Woo! Ooh, ring armor. All right. Equip ring armor. 99! Oh, my armor did max out. The short bow trick worked. So if you equip both short bows, somehow it maxes out your armor. Hey, I'll take it. All right. I'm sick of dying in this game. <laughs> 99 armor rating right there. That's how you get the job done. By cheating. So thank you to whoever figured out that if you equip both short bows, you max out your armor. Super helpful. Look, laser eyeballs. Now I am battling red floor sharks. Uh oh, and I'm almost dead too. Uh, let's see, let's see. Use hypnosis cane. I guess this labyrinth isn't so fatal after all. Ha <laughs> ha. Get out of my way so I can find the stairs. Doesn't this place have an elevator? <laughs> There's gotta be an easier way to get to the top. Do not need that. Alright. Here we go. Music finally changes. Level 10. I'm gonna use my scroll and confuse the enemies. The monsters are confused. Apparently so am I. Whoa. Ah, oh, stop confusing me. It's... God, these freaking stupid necromancers. Nuke them from orbit. Or at least give them the finger. There we go. Definitely feel better. This game's not bad, actually. I'm not usually into these, uh, like, dungeon-crawling games, but for some reason, I kinda like this one. It's simple. That's what makes it fun. You just, you just run into enemies and hack and slap. Ooh, ooh, the fire tree! One at a time. I'm definitely not fighting two of you idiots at the same time. Oh, would you stop getting confused? Oh, you suck. <laughs> He's going like almost the opposite direction of what I'm pushing, but not fully. All right, let's just go up to the next level. I'm sure level 18 will be a lot easier. Yep. The sword already attack already stabs me in the butt. Ooh, food. I like the controls in this game because you can fight monsters and read the back of the box at the same time. Dragonia has arisen. Darkness will consume the world unless the holy goblet is taken from the dragon's vile talons. You are Tricar, a brave swordsman. Chojin cho cho chosen by the villagers to rescue them from eternal doom. Am I still fighting this bag of money? All right, let's just use a cane on it. Uh, use blizzard cane. Bravely enter Dragonia Castle, uncover a vast array of weapons and magic with their... Hey, finally. 
Uh, oh, I almost died on that one. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't. Alright, I am severely out of, like, health things. Ah, oh, this is not good. Quick! Chaos scroll! Chaos scroll! Chaos scroll! <laughs> Even with 99 armor! Look how sad they all are! My guy died! Thankfully I can continue. Level 15? What? Oh, come on! Stupid ninja stole my armor again! That's when my armor rating was dropping. Because the ninjas stole my armor. Kleptomaniac ninjas. Now he's still... Oh man. He broke my helm. Alright, let's see if I can't make... Oh, that's, that's a lot. Let's sneak up here to level 18. Ooh, I've destroyed Medusa. Well, that's good. Nobody likes her. I hate these stupid necromancers! Look what I got. That's right. The lightning sword. So basically a lightsaber. Very excited about that. And over here in the corner, if we look closely, move the camera. Mutton! Somebody eats well tonight. Let's go up one more. The music has changed again! Oh! Look at this, Medusa heads. Nobody likes you! No! I've been killed! Curse the fatal labyrinth! Next time I'm only going to enter the mildly dangerous hallway.